Hi, thanks for joining me at the Apologist Bookshelf. I'm Gary Zacharias. I'm looking at a book that I didn't uh, cover yet. It's called Confident Faith by Mark Middleberg. came out um, roughly 10 years ago, I think it was. And Middleberg's a best-selling author. Uh, he's, he's got a lot of people who back this book, uh, Lee Strobel, Max Lucado, Louis Palau, Dan Kimball, and others. And so I'm just going to start in at the very beginning of the subtitle, Building a Firm Foundation for Your Beliefs. And I want to start with uh, his opening part, which is actually a comment by Lee Strobel. And we all know Strobel with The Case for Christ and his other Case for books. He said that he really wishes that he had this book available when he looked at his wife, who had become a Christian, and saw her life and how, what good things were happening to her, that he wanted to investigate Christianity. And he said it would have been a lot easier if he'd had this guide. And so he said, uh, we have to be careful when we're trying to figure out what's true out there in the world of uh, religious faith. He said there's so many different angles that we can go to. So some of them will bring us toward the truth and others lead us into confusion. And so he says this book would help you maneuver through a minefield of all sorts of contradictory claims about what's true. And the goal is to get people toward a confident faith. And I like the fact that uh, Strobel points out that Middleburg will give reasons for confidence, not just you ought to trust it just because. But he's got, toward the end of his book, he's got what he calls 20 arrows. And uh, there are different points that will compel us to, to really think about Christianity as true, not just something that's nice for us, but actually true. And uh, Middleburg, he points out, has excellent academic credentials, and he's uh, spent people spent uh, several decades, I guess, helping people find a firm foundation for their beliefs. And so Strobel says he really likes the style of the books, that he walks alongside you as you're looking at different truth claims and to come to your own conclusion. So he says that wherever you are in your spiritual adventure, you're going to find yourself encouraged and challenged. And then at the end, Strobel, uh, with his intro, says, you're going to walk away with everything you need to find a truly confident faith in Jesus Christ. And I think that's what we're all aiming for. So let's let's take a look at the first chapter here. Uh, well, as the intro to that, this is Middleburg now speaking how to use the book. And he said, we all believe things that we hope are true, but how do we know for sure? And isn't that the key question about any kind of religion? I mean, you can look at their holy books, you can look at their followers, you can look at their leaders, you can consider what they ask you to do, and you just hope they're true. But how do you end up with real confidence and real trust? And he says, if you're a Christian, how certain are you that your faith is really based on reliable information, that it's really true? So he says the first part of the book is going to look at the meaning of faith and uh, who has faith and what it does. And he talks about six faith paths that people can take. And there's a, a questionnaire to fill out to see what each person's faith path is that reads the book. And then he spends chapters uh, that unpack each of those faith paths. And he said at the end of the section, there's one more chapter that helps you com to compare and weigh those six different approaches. And then after that, there come the 20 arrows of truth. He says point to the truth of the Christian faith. Now, he has arguments from science and logic and uh, why we can believe the Bible, trust it as a reliable book, and then information from history and human experience. So he said he hopes that you can hang on to that, that part of the book, those 20 arrows, and use it as like a reference tool in the future. And I'll just tell you right now, they are good, but I'm not going to cover that yet today. Then uh, the closing section is called 10 Barriers to Belief, and he covers some of the most uh, the usual impediments that keep us from journeying toward a confident faith. All right, so let's go to chapter one then. He says, what is faith? And then who has it? He says, think about how all the ways that you used faith in your typical day. You got up in the morning and you ate food that you hoped nobody had poisoned. And maybe you stopped by a coffee shop and took something and assumed that it would be healthy and not bad. Uh, you took an elevator maybe at work. You trusted that that was going to work. Uh, you sat in a chair and trusted that would hold you, and on and on and on. He said, so the main point is that all of us live our lives by faith every day, even in these 
boring details of elevators and sitting in chairs. So he says, so if we're living by faith, what do we mean by that term? So here's Middleberg's definition of faith. Beliefs and actions that are based on something considered to be trustworthy even in the absence of absolute proof. Now let me take a second go back to that. So it's beliefs and actions that are based on something considered to be trustworthy. Okay, so notice it's not just how you feel about it, but you can you do something or you think about something because you think it's trustworthy, even though you can't say, I'm 100% sure about this. He says, you know, we live by faith, even those uh, tiny details that he talked about, sitting in chairs. But he said, we also live by faith in the bigger issues concerning religion and God and eternity. He said, uh, if you're a Christian... What are you doing? You're trusting in the teachings of Jesus. And he says, you know, even non-religious people live in the trust that their non-religious beliefs are accurate and that they're not going to have to face a religious maker at the end of their lives. He, oh, somebody may say, oh, I, I don't worry about things like that. But, you know, even that is an expression of faith, Middleburg points out. What kind of faith? Faith that it's okay not to worry about those things. So you just assume that. He said, even if you take those well-known atheists like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris, he said, they live their lives accepting something they cannot prove, that there is no God. They don't know they're correct. They just believe and they act as if they are. So he uses Dawkins as an example. He's probably the best-known activist for atheism. He admitted recently that he was only 6.9 out of 7 in terms of his certainty that there's no God. He said, I think the probability of a supernatural creator existing is very, very low. Isn't that interesting? But he, he can't say he's 100% sure. He doesn't know that there's no God. He takes it on faith. Now, he, he obviously thinks that he's got an educated conclusion that is a preponderance of the evidence. But still, his conclusion is a belief that he holds in the absence of real proof. It's a conclusion that seems to him to be the right one. But it goes beyond what can be known with certainty. He said that's just the way life is. Milberg says we all live by some form of faith in something. And he comes down to what he calls the central question of the book. All right, if we're all living by some form of faith, is ours a well-founded faith? Is it a wise faith? A faith that makes sense? Is it supported by the facts? One that works in real life and is worth hanging on to? I think those are excellent questions. If anybody has any kind of a faith system that they're willing to talk to you about or you talk to them about your faith system, these are the great questions, aren't they? Is it a well-founded faith? There you go. Is it well-founded? Is it wise? Does it make sense? Is it supported by facts? Does it work? Is it worth hanging on to? So then Middleburg aims more at us. He said, is yours a faith you've really thought about and intentionally chosen? And he, came, uh, he then comes to the part where he tells his story. He went to college and realized that he'd been pretty passive when he grew up about his faith. He, he grew up believing in Jesus and he trusted in the Bible and accepted that the church was the carrier of God's truth. And do do do, you know, life is good and everything's fine. Then he went to college, took a philosophy class. And he had a professor who was a real uh, out there person, said he delighted in dismantling what he called simplistic beliefs of Christian students. And Middleburg says, I felt like I was one of his favorite targets. The professor pointed out problems with the Bible, with traditional views about God, and all sorts of things that Middleburg had been taught. And he said, it kind of woke Middleburg up. And he said, I, I got to find out. Uh, I'm losing my faith pretty quickly. So he said, where else could I go? He said, I went to my church. But he said his initial attempts to get answers from some of the leaders were disheartening. And I've just got to tell this story because it just it makes me cringe, makes me feel bad. I'm glad Middleburg finally got some good answers. But I, I just feel like there are a lot of people that are going to encounter something like this. So Middleburg goes to his church. He says, I was told by one of my adult Sunday school teachers that my faith was being assailed. And you just need to know why it's true. And that's what Middleburg said. Yeah, how do we know the Bible is really true, that it's actually God's word? And here's the answer. This adult Sunday school teacher, remember this is a Sunday school teacher, adult Sunday school teacher. So somebody that supposedly is one that's wise in the way of the Bible and everything. So Middleburg said, how do we know the Bible's true? That's really God's word. Oh, said the leader, that's easy. 
It says right here in the New Testament, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now let me pause there for just a minute. I bet you can see the problem with that. So remember, Middleburg is asking this guy, why should I trust the Bible? How do we know it's true? And the answer is, it says so, right in the New Testament, that it's true. Do you see the problem? Middleburg did. He said, well, I, I know that verse. I, I know it. But how do we know that what it says is true? And this adult teacher said, because it says it is. It's the word of God. Ah, Middleburg said, but that's the question we're trying to answer. How do we know it's really the word of God? It says, he gazed at me with a look that betrayed his suspicion that I was sinking into the quicksand of skepticism or maybe even becoming an infidel. And then he said, well... He said, you need to realize there's no higher authority than God's revelation. If God says it's true, then you can bank your life on it. Okay, I reply wearily, but how do you know that God is really the one talking here? Lots of religious books claim to have God talking in them. The Quran, the Book of Mormon. You don't believe those, do you? No, he said, but that's because those other books are not the word of God. Oh, so Middleburg just gave up. He just uh, he said, I had to let that go. And he said, I still had the same questions churning in my mind. He said, thankfully, he found some other teachers and books that helped to be a lot more helpful. He said, I'll come back to my story later. But he said, this helped me realize that people hold on to all kinds of religious beliefs, whether they're right or wrong, for pretty weak and unfounded reasons. So he said, I determined right then and there that regardless of where I ended up with my faith, I was going to have my conclusions based on more solid criteria than that which some of the teachers that I knew what they were clinging to. He tells another story. By the way, I think telling stories is so powerful when we're dealing with uh, theological issues. So he said uh, a few years ago he bought a new mountain bike. And he, he said, I, I didn't want to just go buy one because it was on sale or whatever. He's going to be a serious mountain biker. So he started doing some research and uh, putting aside money. And he wanted a, a full suspension, a no-nonsense, bona fide mountain bike. So he started reading magazines. He looked for information online. He, he read reviews. He talked to other people. He studied pros and cons on things like the frame and the kind of uh, uh, safety issues the bike might have and Google searches and on and on. So he said it ended up getting a really nice bike. He said a lot of money. And a lot of time. He said he even read up on things like the best pedals and riding shoes. So he said he loves it. He said, why do I explain all this? He said, most of us spend a lot more time researching and discussing and seeking wisdom about decisions that are really not particularly important. Things like the clothes we wear or the sports gear we get or what to plant or which university to attend or whatever it is. We spend more time on those kinds of things, doing research and discussing and seeking wisdom than we do on the big issues, like what do we believe about God? How are we going to respond to the claims of Jesus? What about the Bible and what it says? Or, or where are we going to spend eternity? He said, we've got our priorities backwards. I think that's exactly right. Uh, I love sports, and so I can quote statistics sometimes and uh, follow certain teams and certain players, and uh, <laughs> you think about it, it's really kind of stupid in the long run. I don't want to put anybody down who likes sports, but does that affect our eternity? No. Does it affect anything about who Jesus is? No. Does that encourage our faith at all? No. Uh, so, I mean, I'll still follow sports. I still enjoy that kind of stuff. But I just have to realize sometimes my priorities are backwards. He said, uh, don't you think it's worth time spending some uh, significant time reflecting on your faith? He says, if you're a Christian, he said, I think it's going to enhance and strengthen your beliefs. It'll give you more confident faith. There's the title of the book. So he says, my goal is to help you think through the beliefs you have about God and your spiritual life. You know, what beliefs are worth hanging on to? And he talks again about those 20 arrows of truth. But he said, uh, which approach to deciding what to believe is the most helpful? So he said, we've got to step back and think about how we're thinking about this stuff. And that's what he's going to do in the first section of his book here. So he said, we're going to unpack six common approaches. He calls them six faith paths that people take to arrive at their particular spiritual points of view. And I think that's really important. And to do to do that well, he said, why don't you get involved first? Take a questionnaire. There's something like 41 or 42 questions. 
and see where you are as far as those six different faith paths. Which one seems to be the one that you're on? Now, you said you can understand yourself, maybe to figure out um, you want to move toward more certainty in your faith. Uh, He said it can help you better understand your friends and relatives. And he said this book promises to help you build a strong foundation for your beliefs. So that's what he's trying to do here. So this is nothing but an intro to the book, and I hope it encourages you, maybe uh, causes you to think about getting hold of a copy. I know sometime I want to do this book with our apologetics class at our church because I think there's a lot of good material here. So it's called Confident Faith, Mark Middleberg. That's M-I-T-T-E-L-B-E-R-G. Mark Middleberg is the author. Well, thanks, and I hope you're having a good day, and we'll do another podcast soon.